Today we're going to take a look at the topic of greenhouse effect and look at what that means and look at some of the data behind um, examining um, both CO2 level concentrations in the atmosphere as well as the uh, increase of, of temperature uh, globally. And this is a section uh, 5.2 um, of IB. And the first thing that we want to look at is the, the carbon cycle. Um, in the atmosphere, there's about 0.038% uh, um, by volume is made up of carbon. Um, and the presence of carbon is maintained by a balance between the fixation of gas during photosynthesis and the release of CO2 by respiration, combustion, and decay. And so one of the things that you need to be able to do is uh, to be able to draw um, and to produce a, uh, an overall carbon cycle. And so this is a nice diagram that I found that did a pretty good job of outlining um, the different parts of the carbon cycle. Carbon or CO2 can be found in the atmosphere. Um, and that's one of the places that it can be found. But it can also be found in a number of different locations. And that's what's showed in this gray here. Uh, carbon stores, excuse me. Um, so we've got some uh, in the ocean surface, we find some carbon as well as deep ocean. Um, some of that deep ocean carbon can form uh, between sediment and sedimentary rock. And that's where this carbon um, either from, um, that, that's in the rock formation or from organisms that have died uh, millions of years ago, uh, for, decay and form coal, oil, natural gas, um, these fossil fuels. How does that carbon then get released back into the atmosphere? By combustion, by respiration, and by the decay of organisms. And so we kind of get this overall cycle, this continual um, transfer of carbon. Carbon can get exchanged uh, between organisms simply by feeding relationships. Cow, for example, eating grass, it's consuming that carbon, uh, those sugars from the grass. The cow then eventually dies and then or it decays and releases that carbon back into the cycle. And so we see this continual, um, continual cycle and release of carbon dioxide and intake of carbon dioxide. If you need some time to, uh, to sketch this out, go ahead and pause the video right now. So what is the purpose of carbon dioxide and, and what is this thing called the greenhouse effect? What does it do? Well, essentially, um, sunlight from the sun uh, warms up the, the sea and the earth. And when that happens, so we've got some sunlight coming through here, um, earth radiates infrared radiation back towards space in which a lot of the heat doesn't escape. And it doesn't escape, um, it's reflected back to earth by clouds and ga the gases of the atmosphere. And so some of this, this heat gets trapped um, in the atmosphere surrounding the planet. Um, CO2 and other gases in the atmosphere help to treat, uh, to, to uh, keep this, this heat around the planet. Um, without this process of this, most of this heat getting trapped and forming kind of a pocket or, or uh, enclosure around the Earth, uh, the planet would be way too cold. We wouldn't be able to survive. Things wouldn't grow. Um, it would be way, way too cold. Um, and so atmospheres, gases like CO2, water vapor, methane, and pollutants, uh, including nitrous oxide, um, help to trap uh, this heat. Well, what happens if these gases level increase too much and too much heat is trapped? Because if the, the amount of CO2 and the amount of pollutants um, increase in the atmosphere, it's going to trap more heat. Um, and so an increase in greenhouse gases trapped in the atmosphere can result in increased heat in the atmosphere. And so how do we know this? Where does the data come from that supports this? And that's what we're going to take a look at. And so these, uh, this data is coming from these ice cores that can be extracted from um, big chunks of ice in the Arctic. And they can actually give us information going back uh, hundreds of thousands of years um, to give us a better idea of what Earth's atmosphere was like during those times. And so this information um, comes from these ice core stations. And uh, the, the information that I'm going to show you here is from the Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center. And they basically have a range of information from 137 to 795, 100,000 years before the present. And we can measure the CO2 and methane levels um, from these different ice cores. And so they're, they're coming from a couple of different uh, locations. All of these red dots are different um, stations where ice cores have been removed. We're going to look at this vo uh, Volstock, I think is how you pronounce it, um, that 
group of data. And by analyzing and extracting these big, long ch uh, chunks of ice coal, we can basically measure and determine the amount of carbon dioxide and methane present in the atmosphere over the course of, uh, over time. And if you look at this, this data that's been graphed here, um, you can see there's some natural up and down, up and down, up and down, where there's a, a peak and then a drop in the carbon dioxide level, and then an increase and a decrease, increase and a decrease. And that continues um, it's very similarly like for methane as well. Um, if we look at the global temperature and carbon dioxide levels, um, we can see here the increase in carbon dioxide, CO2 concentration, um, has a... Uh, could be correlated to the increase in overall temperature. Um, and this is only going back from the 1880s to the 2000s. And this data is coming from the National Climate Data Center. And what it's looking at is the global average temperature measured over land and seas. And so the blue bars represent temperatures below the 1901 to 2000 average. So these are temperatures, uh, years in which the temperature was below that average. And the red bars are representing years in which that temperature was above the overall average. And again, the black line is showing us the CO2 concentration. And so you can see here with a lower CO2 con uh, concentration, the blue indicating years with below average temperatures um, quite a few, and then as CO2 concentration goes up, so does the overall average temperature or years above that average level of temperature. Um, and so some interesting data here. You're probably thinking, well, in our last graph, we've, we've seen here how CO2 goes up and goes down, goes up and goes down. And yes, that, that is, um, historically, that is what we've seen happen with CO2 levels and, and temperatures. But the problem is, and, and what we're seeing more of, is that the levels of CO2 and the temperatures are rising more, uh, essentially, above average. And that's what's, what's concerning and um, what could potentially cause some major problems here. Um, and so one of those problems potentially could be the sea level. If we look at the same time period from 1880 to about 2000, um, we can see that the annual averages of, of global sea level, what we're looking at here, um, the red is showing as the sea level since 1870, blue is a tide gauge, um, and the black are satellite observations. And so we only have a bit of data um, for the uh, satellite observations here, uh, going back to about the 1980s. But we can see overall that the sea levels are increasing. If the temperature of the planet, if average temperatures are e increasing, um, stores of water that are essentially frozen um, are going to heat up and melt, and as a result of the melting, it's going to increase sea levels. Just by changing sea levels uh, a, a, few, a few centimeters even in some cases, uh, a meter in some cases can have some big, big, uh, pretty big profound effects on the overall ecosystem. If you think about um, New Orleans, uh, quite a few years ago with the major flooding in New Orleans, or even just uh, last year um, in, in New York with Hurricane Sandy, um, cities and, and locations that are, that are essentially right at sea level, um, an increase in sea level is going to have a drastic effect on, um, on those cities. Um, and if you think about this from an overall ecosystem standpoint, uh, change in, in sea level is going to have a, also a big effect on the organisms that, that live. In. And so if we kind of put all, together all of this, this data and this information, it would suggest that potentially uh, temperatures globally on average are increasing, which are going to cause some problems. And uh, for, the entire, uh, for the entire planet. Um, this kind of leads into our, our next topic of the precautionary principle. And this principle is essentially that when an activity raises threats of harm, measures should be taken, even if the cause and effect relationships uh, have not yet been established scientifically. And so, nice kind of funny comic here, um, prove that we'll be boiled. Uh, so one frog says, prove we won't be boiled. Um, and another one says, prove that we will be boiled. And they're sitting in a, in a, in a, a, a pan here, uh, essentially getting ready to boil. And so what this is looking at is, and essentially saying is that steps should be taken even if, uh, if the potential threat level is so high, uh, could cause so many problems, that steps should be taken to, to try to stop this, um, even if the, the data scientifically um, is not completely collected. Um, and, and so some likely consequences of, 
um, this potential of increased CO2 levels and increased temperature globally. Um, one being a meltdown of polar ice caps and glaciers, which would then increase sea levels. Uh, warming of sea waters causing expansion and raising of sea level waters. Flooding of lowlands, we talked about that already. Um, raising of seawater temperature causing a failure of um, algae photosynthesis, being able to produce, um, uh, to be able to photosynthesize, which would then raise and increase atmospheric CO2 levels uh, because that algae is not being able to see, uh, photosynthesize. Destruction of forests due to increased temperatures and interruption of ocean current systems that distribute warm water and um, the overall current system. Um, some things that we could do to combat some of these issues. One, conserve fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuels. Um, potentially develop nuclear power sources. Uh, develop renewable power sources, wave and wind power. Um, you could also throw solar power into that as well. Uh, increased development of biofuels, um, sources of energy. Reduce the use of fossil fuels for heating and transport. Um, and then terminate destruction of forests, particularly rainforests. Some potential consequences for Arctic systems where we uh, would see probably some of the largest effects to start overall. One um, would be kind of an ice desert. Two, low-lying low -lying treeless land with little vegetation and no trees. Um, this is be these conditions here are basically what we see in the Arctic system currently. Um, we'll look at some of the effects that they would have in just a second. Uh, has very little soil. Most of the things that live there um, that exist there, very little lives there, are frozen. And most of the nutrients are frozen and released during short, warm periods of growth. Some consequences for these ecosystems would be loss of ice habitats and thus increased flooding, decay of microorganisms leading to a release of methane and CO2, um, appearance of conifers, uh, plants that would radiate heat and increase overall warming, arrival of insect eating species, wider flora and arrival of small mammals and predators, increased presence of pathogens. And for some of these you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? You know, there's more trees and there's insects that are showing up, it's just going to be an expand, expansion of a larger ecosystem. Well, the first problem with that would be um, the removal of this Arctic e ecosystem. Um, but, and additional problems would be the potential of rising sea levels um, and a disruption of the species that are currently living there. And so this overall process of global warming and the greenhouse effect um, could, po could create some major global problems um, for humans and for everything that lives on the planet uh, if this trend in the data continues. And so in class, we're going to take a look at some uh, of the different uh, sources of data and examine those a little bit further uh, in a couple classes from now.